Welcome to another video from Cardboard East. My name's Jay. I play board games from Asia and share it if I with all of you. This year, International Spiel Tie has an app. And if you download the app, you can even filter the games by country. And you'll be able to see that there are a ton of games coming from Asia. Me, being the nice guy that I am, I'm just here to help out. So I'm gonna help review all the board games that I play. Booth by booth. Now I've already reviewed several booths already and today we're going to talk about BG Nations. I'll give you a second if you don't know what BG stands for. And it's not board games, it's big games. Oh my gosh. This game, this game, 12 Rivers, won't even fit horizontally or vertically in that calyx space. <sighs> big. Hey gamers, before we get started into the content, I just want to say thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for all your support. It really means a lot to us. We definitely appreciate it. If you like this content and you like the videos that we have, please like and subscribe. And if you think our content is worth a couple of bucks a month, please consider joining our Patreon. Now, PG Nations first made a splash in 2019 with the release of Yin Yang. Yin Yang isn't the first game to be called Yin Yang. In fact, if you go to BGG, there are quite a few, but I'm going to argue that this one by far is the best. Yin Yang is a 1 to 4 player area control game that combines set collection, pick up and deliver, and action programming. However, all those mechanisms combined isn't what garnered attention. What garnered attention was this. Yin Yang became known as the Metal Turtle Shell Game because in the game included this metal shell. Now, this is an awesome gimmick and it has a ton of table presence, but is there a game beyond this? Well, let's find out. Yin Yang will be played over five rounds, and each round is gonna consist of four phases. The first phase is known as the way and the will of the gods. So you will take this turtle shell, you will shake it up and drop six metal coins. Now, each of these metal coins is double-sided. They do not have the same side. Um, you don't really need these little stickers of white and black on them, but you can add them for ease of play. Now, by dividing what was rolled by these coins, certain actions will not be available to the players this particular round. Now, phase two of the game is the divination phase, and that will mean each player will then take their personal six coins, shake them up, and you could use the turtle if you really want to, shake them up and then drop the coins out. However, unlike the first phase where the coins are numbered one through six, players have a chance to rearrange their coins any way that they want to. Depending on the order that they raise their coins, they'll be able to take certain actions. And these actions can include anything by traveling by river, traveling by road, building a temple, picking up a good, moving up the turn order track, then players will take these coins and put them off into pairs on the bottom of their playmat. Depending on the combinations that they use, we'll be able to create further actions that they'll program their scholar to move, pick up goods, or build temples. Slowly but surely, their scholars will move around the board, picking up goods, building temples, traveling by a boat or by road. And then phase four comes and it's wash, rinse, and repeat. Now, why are people building temples? Well, it's an area control game. So whoever has the majority of the temples in a certain region in ancient China, they'll score a certain amount of points at the end of the game. Why are people picking up goods? Well, in the top right-hand corner of their player mat, there will be places for them to drop their goods. And if they're able to create a line or a row or a diagonal line, they'll be able to activate one of the scoring tiles. Then at the end of five rounds, whoever has the highest score wins yin yang. Now, that was a very brief overview of the rules of Yin Yang, but let's talk about what I thought about it, and I'm going to start off with the negatives. Now, there were a lot of comments, especially when this came out in 2019, about how unnecessary this was or the middle coins, and what a difference a few years made. Now, we're in 2022, and with crowdfunding campaigns, with pledges that are pushing three, four, five hundred dollars $500, this doesn't really seem that extravagant. And there were arguments that this was unnecessary, and I'm gonna argue that, yeah, you know, every miniature from every miniature game is kind of unnecessary. Sleeving your cards is unnecessary. Having game inserts is unnecessary. 3D printed components are unnecessary. I think it's very easy for us to forget that board gaming is a luxury hobby, and 
all of it for the most part is unnecessary. So by saying that this is unnecessary, I find that's a little bit unfair. That's like giving out speeding tickets at the Indy 500. A good complaint I'd say is all of these stickers. And while these stickers aren't really necessary because it is quite easy to tell which side is which, I do appreciate that the stickers are there because it does make the game go by a lot faster and smoother. However, applying these stickers was not fun. Now on the yin side, it's a nice smooth surface, so it's quite easy. But on the yang side, there are these ridges here and that makes applying these stickers not fun. Now, some people say it's like, well, you should just get Othello pieces and use them there. And I really, really disagree with that idea. Because the turtle shell and the metal coins really fit the theme of this game. In fact, BG Nations went all out because this is a big box. You can't fit this vertically in a Kalex shell. Absolutely not. This has to lay flat like you're some crazy person who stores their games horizontally. Take a look at these divine intervention cards. These are cards that give you a special power if you use it. If you don't use it, it's just worth victory points. Yeah, I've seen that in lots of other games, but I haven't seen it on this big of a paper. This is fantastic and highly thematic. Everything that they used for this game served the theme of this game. But I think it's unfair to say that they had an outlandish production because the temples are still cubes. If they wanted to, they could have had 3D printed temples out there and I'm sure those exist somewhere out there but wooden cubes I think easy to read and they're easy to pick up and move. There is a lot of randomness in Ying Yang. The randomness from the beginning of the round knowing which actions no one will be able to take and the randomness of you rolling your dice or coins and figuring out what actions you can and can't take. The last thing that I have to mention is that this plays one to four players and I think this is probably best at three. At four players it can be kind of rough being that last player and having all the ashes taken away from you and you're kind of left without a choice. When you play four players, it kind of feels like the main goal of the game is to not be last place because it's gonna be quite painful and you're pushing up the turn order track as high as you can. However, at three players, there's a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more space for you to kind of do almost everything that you want to do, which is where the game should be. Now, positives. This is a gorgeous production. Now, despite the box being obnoxiously big, and I still don't think the box needs to be this big, the board looks great. The player boards look great. The manufacturing of this was fantastic because I've had this now for a few years. I live in a very humid environment and I have desiccants in almost all of my games and these boards have not warped at all. The metal coins are always a nice touch. There's always fiddly gamers every time I play games. Someone playing with their cues, someone flipping through their cards, and these metal coins definitely get their fair share of it, but they add this nice tactile feel to the game. And everybody, everybody wants to take turns using the turtle shell. I will say that Yin Yang does rise up more than some of its parts, and it is something that is very unique. And I think that this is one of the more unique games to ever come out of Taiwan. When it hits the table, it definitely has a nice amount of table presence. Everybody wants to know what you're playing, but chances are everybody already knows what you're playing because these components are just great. I didn't mention this, but even the quality of these Divine Intervention cards um, is quite nice. They all have a nice linen finish, and, and even though there really is no need for that, they went the extra mile and did it. Now, normally I have a big thing against uh, cards that don't have rounded corners, but this works for this game. One lesson I do want to mention is that the rule book, it's not great. I think this harkens back to games from about 20 years ago. Now, while I appreciate the gameplay of games uh, from that long ago, I don't appreciate the rule books. There is a lot of text in here and I definitely would appreciate it, uh, more pictured examples and just a better structured rule book. And while the rules aren't long, there's just the big walls and walls of text and I think that I would have really preferred more visual cues and more examples in the rule book. Now I do get a lot of questions about what are some hidden gems in Asia and this is definitely one of them. This is a great addition to your collection and I definitely think it's going to stand the test of time. This game can be a little bit much and a little bit of an overload the first time you're playing the game, but it's actually quite simple and very approachable. I played this with kids as young as eight and 10, and they seem to be handling and doing much better than me, unfortunately. But that's Yi Yang by BG Nations.
Now, BG Nations will only have three games after SN Booth. The second game will be Xia Hui Shi. Xia Hui means society. Shi means things, like things to do. So you can translate this in lots of different ways. Things of society, societal affairs, the way of society. But no, they chose corrupt parliament. And I think that's really telling for what this game is. Now, normally when I review games, I tend to think, what is a game? Where's the hook? Where's the one thing that's gonna draw players in? How do the designers are going to fence their idea and say, this game is unique, this game is worth playing? My first impression of Corrupt Parliament was the box art. Look at how intricately detailed this cover is. It is a future dystopia of bright neon and construction. I felt slightly unsure and uncomfortable about what this game was and if it was going to be for me or if I would enjoy it. But is Corrupt Parliament all about the art? Or is it about the rulebook? The rulebook itself is this otherworldly experience that I definitely recommend anybody reading. There are just walls and walls of text with hilarious examples and dialogue about what to negotiate, how to negotiate. Is this what separates it from everything else? Or is Corrupt Parliament all about the cards? Corrupt Parliament is a negotiation game where players are vying for control of the city while voting on weird laws such as castrate lecherous married men, develop land to build sex industrial park, have minimum wage of foreign workers, or permission to run love motel at farmhouse. Now, I admit that some of that English is a little bit broken and they could have used a copy editor, but it definitely feeds into this theme of this dystopian nightmarish future. Then I thought maybe Corrupt Parliament is all about the characters. Now, Corrupt Parliament is a negotiation game, so perhaps the hook is all the characters and archetypes that the players will find themselves as. But like every negotiation game, what are you negotiating for? One of the most interesting things about Corrupt Parliament is that the money uses the Chinese system. Now, you may not know this, but they count numbers differently in different languages. In Chinese, they'll say yi wan, which is one ten thousand. So one million will be one hundred ten thousands. But I find it really interesting that Corrupt Parliament uses this number system on all their money and on the boards, which can be a little confusing at times. Now, Corrupt Parliament comes in a very, very slender box. You will not be able to fit everything in here once you punch everything out. You will have to take that insert and throw it away. Typically, I put money into one bag, but I can't because one, my bags aren't big enough, and two, the bag won't fit in here. So I have to Walter White it and separate my cash. But is Corrupt Parliament all about the cash? Now, while Corrupt Parliament is a negotiation game, there's also a stock market mechanic built into the game. Players are slowly investing into different aspects of the city. Every round, players will be voting on laws. Each law will affect the market in different ways, making some industries worth more and some industries worth less, therefore affecting each player's net worth. But that is not what Corrupt Parliament is all about. There's even an election mechanic where players will be placing their tokens into a bag, and at the end of each round, slowly pulling tokens out of the bag and seeing if they get re-elected. But this is not what Corrupt Parliament is about. Corrupt Parliament is a negotiation game for four to six players that takes anywhere from an hour to two hours to play. But if you're asking me what Corrupt Parliament is all about, it's this. Or should I say, it's these. Corrupt Parliament has a very fascinating envelope mechanic. Now, each round, as I said before, players will be voting on laws. Laws that will affect the stock market, which will affect their net worth. So you always want laws to pass that are in your favor and laws that are not in your favor to fail. And in order to do that, you need to bribe the other players. And you only have three envelopes. While some negotiation games are fast and loose and players are all wheeling and dealing with every single thing possible, going, oh, I'll do this and I'll help you out next round. Corrupt Parliament distills and boils this down into three envelopes. So in a six player game, if I want a law to pass, I need four people to vote yes. One of them is gonna be me, but I need to sway three other players. So ideally, it's one envelope per player. However, Corrupt Parliament does something very unique. I'll take the bribe, 
put it in this envelope, give it to the other player. The other player receives the envelope, looks inside it, and then decides if they want to take, take the vote or not. If they say, no, this isn't good enough, they can't give the envelope back to me. I have to spend another envelope bribing them and giving it to the other player. Meaning that I have one fewer envelope used for bribing. So Kurth Parliament is a game that forces you to really think about what is the optimal bid and price for everything that you want. You can't just loosely negotiate your way through this game. You have to be precise and you have to be sharp and know exactly the pressure points that you need to give on your opponents. But what's even more fascinating about this envelope is that I don't have to tell any player what's inside. In fact, I don't even have to tell the person what's inside. And the person who receives the envelope doesn't have to reveal what's inside the envelope. However, you can say, here's $10,000. I hope this is enough that we can come to an agreement. But yet when the player looks inside, maybe they find 20,000. So you're lying and manipulating the crowd around you. And when you receive the envelope, you could lie to everyone about the contents. You could say, whoa, that's a little bit more than what I was asking for. But really, they didn't pay you that much. What's even more fascinating is that instead of money, you can actually put stock into these envelopes. Now, the best part about this is that all of it is binding, so that if you vote against the law that you promised to vote for, you have to give the envelope back. Now, there is that stock mechanic and there is the election mechanic, but both of those pale in comparison to these envelopes. Now, while in the election mechanic, you can actually not get elected if you are playing badly, and you can be kind of a lame duck in a round, and that's not fun. But the election is important because if you win the final election of the game, you get a whopping amount of cash. And cash is king. Because at the end of the game, whoever has the most cash wins Corrupt Parliament. Now, Corrupt Parliament does have problems. Like that rule book does have a lot of broken English. There is broken English on the cards. But reading the rules is actually quite pleasurable because it is quite funny. They do have funny examples. And the rules are very clear about step by step what happens and when. If you and your group are into negotiation games, I think this one is definitely worth looking into. But this style of negotiation game really rests on you and your group. Are you the type of group that will make this a fun, interesting experience? If you're not into the theme, that's fine. But if you're not into the negotiation aspect of the game, then this will fall flat. But at the end of the day, I think that if your group really likes negotiation games and you have a chatty bunch that really like to get into each other's faces, I think this envelope system and Corrupt Parliament could be the game for you for the next year. Now, if Corrupt Parliament was the yin, then Troll Rivers is the yang from shadow into the sun because Troll Rivers is beautiful. Now, we could just look and gawk at this now or we can enjoy some nice B-roll. Twelve Rivers is the latest game from BG Nations and it is gorgeous to look at. This is absolutely beautiful and if you want a game that has table presence, this is it. If you're wondering why they call it Twelve Rivers, well it's because there are 12 rivers here and at the beginning of every round, Now, Twelve Rivers is absolutely gorgeous and breathtaking to look at, but let's talk about how to play and then I'll give you my thoughts. Now, Twelve Rivers takes place over five rounds. The first thing that's going to happen is you're going to take these little fairy tokens here and you're going to place them on these tree stumps that are up here, here on the map. Now, for the even rounds, you're going to go on these fox statues and the odd rounds are going to go on the tree stumps. Then you'll flip them over and you'll see like what special abilities they have. The second thing that's going to happen is that the players are going to go in turn order following this track down here and taking their square piece and placing it anywhere on the board. However, as you place these on the mountain, as you get farther and farther up the mountain, you're going to be using more time. Time is represented by these camp cards. By placing your token up here, it's going to cost you four camp cards. By placing your 
token up here, almost to the top, it's only gonna cost you three camp cards. Now down here, it'll be two, and then naturally down here at the very bottom will be one. However, there is another section to the river, which is down here at the very end of the river, and here it won't cost you any of these cards, but you have to get to draw one from the deck. Consequently, there's also down here at the village, the far left pattern here will allow you to immediately draw two cards from the deck. The next one will allow you to draw one from the deck. Now, the other four village spots will not allow you to draw any cards from the deck, but we'll talk about why you would want to go there in just a little bit. Now, if you happen to place your square token next to one of these little fairy tiles and you immediately get to collect it and its special ability. And these can offer a host of different special abilities. Next comes everybody's favorite part and that's when the pearls fall down. Then top to bottom and left to right, players will be taking their squares and one marble. One marble will go on top of their alpaca. They're then gonna take their square and place it here on the turn track. After all the players have taken all their squares, someone here in the lake town will then collect all the marbles that have not been taken and place them on their alpaca, if the alpaca isn't already full. By placing their tokens here on the turn order track, they'll be able to determine the order of the next round. Players in the village will then draft the villager. Each villager is unique, offering you a multitude of ways to score points. Having the most fairy tokens at the end of the game will give you points. Having the most camp cards at the game will give you points. Having complete villagers will give you points. In addition to the points that the villagers give you, they also give you points for a set. So if you're able to collect the three villagers that are not of your color, you'll get four points at the end of the game. Some villagers even give you camp cards as soon as you draft them. The game even comes with various goal cards for each individual game. So if you're the first one to complete this universal goal, then you'll score four points. And that's pretty much the game. You're gonna be doing this wash, rinse, repeat for five rounds only. At the end of the game, you're gonna calculate your score and whoever has the most points wins. You're gonna get points from your villagers, but you're gonna get most points from the marbles or pearls that you collect. White being five points, purple four, red three, blue two, and green one point. Now these fairy tokens that we talked about before uh, all have special abilities. Some of them will allow you to hike up the mountain for free or for a cheaper price or immediately offload the marbles that you collect on your alpaca straight to the villagers. And that's the game. Not a lot of mechanics here but there are a lot of different layers that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. But before we go into my thoughts on the gameplay we need to talk about the engineering of this game. Like any gimmicky game like this I'm always concerned about the engineering. Does it actually do what it's supposed to do? Now, one of the problems that I do have with the game is that these pearls are too small compared to the holes on the villagers. So in a perfect world, the villager should be able to hold the pearl, but it doesn't. It falls right through. Now that typically shouldn't be a problem because it's resting comfortably on the table. And so long as you're not bumping things around, it shouldn't be a problem. However, when you keep the game, it would be easier just to pick up the villager and then dump it into the bag. But instead, you're left with picking up the pearls individually and then dropping them into the bag, which shouldn't be a problem. But remember when I said that these pearls do bounce quite high. In fact, the first time I played this, I dropped one and I lost it. I spent a good 10 minutes looking for it, only to find out that it had bounced up to the second shelf of the calyx. I heard the marble hit the ground and then it bounced all the way up to the second shelf of this calyx. So if you're clumsy like me, that could be something that you need to think about. Now you don't have player shields in this game because everything's open information, but you do have a player aid. And the player aid is, well, just a piece of paper and kind of flimsy and it kind of was expecting something a little bit more than just this. However, I do understand that most of the game's cost went into constructing this, not the player aid. So the question is, does this work? And yes, it does, except when it doesn't. Sometimes the marbles, like pictured here, do get stuck. So it's not perfect. 
but it's pretty easy to fix and not a, that big of an issue, at least not for me. These little wooden components are actually quite nice and they look hand painted and there's even a slight texture to it. And I love, love, love how vibrant these components are. And while it's quite easy to remember that placing up here is four, three, two, one camp cards, I think a little bit of iconography on the board itself would have been a little nicer. And while it is kind of easy to remember that this square, placing it here, costs four, three, two, one camp cards, I would much have preferred that it was written on here or had some iconography, as opposed for me to constantly refer to this player aid. In addition, down here in the villager section, I'm not entirely sure why they didn't add the camp cards of two, one, and zero. On top of that, I really need to talk about these camp cards because all the camp cards look the exact same. And so it begs the question is, why is there a back to these cards? I find that kind of bizarre. Like I don't need to hide the information because they're all the same. So why are they two different colors? Why are there's a front and a back? I don't know. Now, while I've never had a problem with dropping the marbles behind this mountain shield, I do know that some of the people that I played with have had trouble with it. Sometimes a marble slips from their fingers and they drop two marbles instead of one. Sometimes they drop one and it lands into the trough to the next. And so they have to fix it. And the problem with that is that it's supposed to be hidden information about what's here. So now they know what's there and now they have to redo it all again. So while that can be troublesome, I don't think it's a deal breaker. You just need to be careful as you're dropping the marbles one by one across all 12 rivers. The last part that I wanna mention is that the iconography on the villagers can be a little bit confusing. When I've taught this game, I don't teach the players all the individual villagers. I only talk about the ones that are up for the draft for that round. And they can be a little bit confusing. But all of that aside, how does it play? Do you like this game, Jay? And the answer is yes, of course I like it. One, like it's just, it has that cool factor. It has that it factor. It's there on the table. Everyone is looking at you and watching what you're playing. So yeah, it kind of looks cool, but there are actually a lot of little layers hidden in this game. Sure, you can go up high, but then I can go up one above you and steal that marbles from you, reducing the choices that you have. Now you're probably thinking, this looks like a nice, cute, fun little game, and you would be right, but you're also wrong, because this game is really, really tight. Now remember that this is only five rounds, and each round, you're not guaranteed the villager. You have to spend one of your squares going here to draft a villager. Meaning that if you don't go there, you're not gonna draft a villager. And the most villagers you could ever have are five. But you probably don't have enough time to get enough marbles to feed and, and complete all five villagers. So maybe you only need four or three. And on top of that, if you spend one of your squares going to the village, then you only have two squares to get marbles. And maybe you only get two marbles out of that. That hardly seems like a good deal. So you're gonna want to always try and get as many marbles as you possibly can. And therefore you're gonna be vying for the lake town at the very bottom of the rivers. Now that being said is that sometimes everyone cuts in front of you and there's nothing left in the lake for you to have. So there's a lot of back and forth and that you'll have to teeter back and forth. Well, I'm gonna get villagers this round, and then next round I'm gonna just focus on getting lots of marbles. Now, while you can go lower on the riverbed to try and get a, sele a better selection of marbles, you're choosing one out of five or one out of four, you go higher and probably get a better deal, and on top of that, reduce the choices of the person below you, and sometimes the person below you doesn't get a pearl at all. So it can be a little vicious at times. Now, while the villagers are fun to have, and you definitely need them because your alpaca can only carry oh so many pearls, every time I played the game, the majority of my points came from the pearls that I collected and less so from the villagers. Player count. Now, this does play from two to four players. I'm going to recommend this game at four. Now, for a two-player game, you only use six of the rivers, and for a three-player game, you only use nine. 
Now, while that's functional, I don't find that nearly as interesting or as fascinating as the four player game when you use all 12 rivers, because this is called 12 rivers. It's not called 6912 river. Now, I have personal house rule variants that I play for the two player game. Instead of having one alpaca and one faction, I control two factions, and at the end of the game, I multiply the score, and whoever has the highest score wins. So each player has two factions that they're trying to balance out to the best of their ability and you're playing with all 12 rivers. My three player variant is a little bit more complicated. I do plan to post that on BGG sometime in the future, but yes, it uses all 12 rivers because the game is called 12 rivers. So while I can recommend this as a two player game, I absolutely love this game at three and four. Now out of the three games that I play from BG Nations, or that will be at the BG Nations booth, this one I think has the best rule book albeit the biggest rulebook and the most obnoxious. The rules are only four pages long, but those pages are quite big. However, the rulebook is actually very simple and easy to digest, and it had lots of pictures and very clear examples. So even though it was a little bit late into the night, the first time we played this, we were able to play it no problem. Now, the last thing I wanna mention about this game is this giant piece. Now, the bulk of the game is this. And we're going to flip this around here on the side and you can see how this was constructed and put together. So every time you take out the game or put it away, you can have these little pieces here, which will hold up the back end of the board. And then these will fold out. Now, when you store the game, you'll have to bend this backwards like here. And then this piece, well, it can't fold back all the way. You could do this, but even then it doesn't fit all the way flush. So that leaves me putting it into the game box, something like this. And while I'm closing the lid down, I'm very careful not to put too much pressure on the lid because I'm afraid that I might damage this component, which means that 12 Rivers gets the privilege of being at the very top of my board game shelf because I'm not gonna put anything on top of it. Now, luckily that means that you'll probably see more table time, but at the same time, I'm going to be suffering from a lot of anxiety in the future. If you'd like to know more about BG Nations and these three games at their Essen booth 6G121, I'll put a link down in the description below. Once again, my name is Jay. I play board games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. I'm going to put a link here that'll go to some other videos on our Essen preview series that I think you'll enjoy. See you there.